Thank you very much to the organizers. It's a, a fantastic event. I mean, uh, the, the whole venue is so professional and well organized. Um, I'm going to talk about managing osteoporosis with a predominantly plant-based diet and lifestyle approaches. I mean, at the outset, I'll say I'm an ethical vegan, but I understand fully that people may not want to become vegan or uh, convert totally to a plant-based diet. But there are huge advantages in many areas where a plant-based diet wins. And I wanted to just address osteoporosis with the plant-based diet and lifestyle approach. I, um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I've been a consultant orthopedic surgeon since 1998 in London. I, uh, I have over 35 years of experience. I'm predominantly a spinal surgeon, but in my new incarnation, I qualified from the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. So I have some knowledge about the kind of things that affect our health in the long term. So it's more about prevention and reversal of conditions that are chronic uh, with regard to our health. I have an active private practice right now in London. I've just retired from the National Health Service. So this is where lifestyle medicine got me. This is me pre-2017, and you can see I was about 35 kilograms heavier than I am right now. Um, so I took it to the next stage with the plant-based diet, um, and I really felt that the, the difference was huge. I mean, I shed weight without much of an effort. I never felt hungry. I mean, I tried every kind of diet before that. Um, it didn't work. But when I ate an abundant amount of plant-based foods, the weight disappeared. But now I've taken it to a new level where I've started strength training and I've understood the importance of exercise, which I think I really hadn't got till I was 55. And that's a shame. I can see there's some younger ones here, younger people here, but even some older people. And you can start at any age and exercise and good health uh, are synchronized. Once you exercise, you will feel a lot of benefits. And I'll talk about that in this lecture. Now, this was my only understanding of osteoporosis as an orthopedic surgeon. And I'm ashamed to say that all I knew about it was if the hip was broken in a particular area, then we replaced it with a hip replacement kind of device. And if it was broken in another area, which is called the intertrochanteric area, we fixed it with a nail and screws. And I really wasn't interested much in osteoporosis. We handed patients over to the care of the elderly medicine and they put them on a pill. And really, it struck me much later when I did lifestyle medicine that osteoporosis is actually a reversible disorder. It is a disorder that we bring upon ourselves because of our poor lifestyle. And we can address it early or we can address it late. So if you're 75 plus in this audience, don't worry. You can still make a fantastic difference to your osteoporosis. More importantly, I'm going to start by talking about the dangers of osteoporosis, which people think is a painful disorder. But it's actually not a painful disorder unless you get a fracture. That's when it becomes painful. But that is quite late in the game, and it may be too late to change the direction that you've taken down that tunnel, which is going to end in misery. And most people who get a fracture of this kind actually go downhill very rapidly. Before we start about osteoporosis, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of background about bone structure. Most people think of bone as being an avascular piece of chalk. In fact, people think it's a bit of calcium and that's it. But in fact, bone is a vibrantly live structure. It's got blood vessels. It's got a whole lot of cells. It's got a marrow. It's got haversion systems and canals. It's a three-dimensional structure. So it's quite important to actually strengthen your bone in all three dimensions. Um, so this is, just gives you an idea, but at a microstructure level, 
if you look at bone, it's either cancellous bone, which is soft or woven bone, which is typically in the hip area. So that's why it is affected most by osteoporosis. That's where it starts. And then you have the thicker cortical bone, which you all know. Those of you who eat um, meat will know the thicker, denser bone that you really can't bite through. And the softer bone is the marrow area bone. And you get trabeculae uh, at the, uh, under a microscope. But even more so, what is important is understanding that bone decreases. If you look at the timeline, there's a distinct difference between the way female, the sex, uh, there's a massive bone loss due to menopause. And that's about 3% over one year. Normally, you get about a 1% to 8% loss over a decade. But there's a dramatic loss in women because of the loss of effect of estrogens around the age of menopause, which could be anywhere usually between 45 and 55. But increasingly, there are people who get earlier menopause. Men, however, in the audience, don't smile yet because you're not exempt from osteoporosis. It's just a gradual decrease. Remember, estrogen is what protects bone, and men make estrogens also. You make it from testosterone, so it's the aromatase enzyme that converts it. So men are not exempt at all, and increasingly, because of our inactive lifestyles, they also are affected by it. So as I said, you get a three to 8% muscle loss and bone loss every decade, but 3% around menopause in that one year. By 75, you can lose half your muscle mass if you don't take steps to protect it. So in fact, the older you get, the more you should exercise. Bad news for most of, pe most of the people here. So our, our genes were made to last us after age of procreation. So you had your children. Uh, evolution had no use for you. You, know, you, were, you were dead meat to them. So really, we have to work very hard after that to protect ourselves. And we change our skeleton every 10 years. So there's a constant remodeling of bone. Just to give you an idea, there's a, there's a constant process led by osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So osteoblasts are these cells that lie, line those haversion systems that I talked about that make new bones. So they lay down new bone. And osteoclasts break down old bone. Old bone doesn't function quite as well as new bone. So it's important to understand that this process is important. We have to stimulate our osteoblasts. And I'll tell you how to do that as we go along. There are two basic types of osteoporosis, and I'm not going to go into great detail other than to say that primary is the one that is more important. That is the one that is postmenopausal or senile as we get older. And the others are due to underlying disorders, usually hormonal disorders or cancers and a variety of reasons. So obviously the treatment of a secondary osteoporosis is treatment of the cause. And fracture risk is what makes this condition important. The risk is not so low in men. It's one in five men get an osteoporotic fracture, and one in three women have a lifetime risk of osteoporosis. It's also, unfortunately, exceedingly common in India, and it's under-recognized and under-treated. So I think it's particularly important for the Indian population to wake up to this. What affects our risk? Well, genetics is obviously important. There is a family history. So if you have one of your parents who had a hip fracture, then be worried that you're next in line for that. Anybody above the age of 50, more common in women, as I said, and underlying inflammatory disorders like the ones mentioned here, like Crohn's disease, et cetera, or where there are problems with calcium absorption and metabolism, and we'll cover those in a little bit of detail. But this is something that all of you may be familiar with. It's called a DEXA scan. It's a simple tool for measuring bone density. All you do is you lie under this machine. It takes about five minutes to go up and down, and they give you a number at the end of it. They throw colorful graphs like this, which nobody really understands, and they give you these 
T-scores and people, that number is important. So if you know a T-score, that is important. It doesn't tell you too much more though, and I'll uh, just dissect it out for you as to why this is important. There are more innovative technologies that are coming up called ultrasound. It doesn't just measure density, but it'll actually measure bone strength. And strength is different to density. We'll get into that in uh, conversation, I think. But what you're looking at in the WHO classification for osteoporosis is a normal T-score is minus one or higher. If you're between minus one and minus 2.5, it's called osteopenia, which means you're on track to getting osteoporosis if you don't change your behavior or your lifestyle. And osteoporosis is anything minus 2.5 or lower. Unfortunately, most doctors, and great respect for doctors, I'm one of them, but they don't have a background of lifestyle medicine. And most doctors, if you're diagnosed to be osteoporotic, they literally want to wrap you up in bubble wrap and tell you not to do anything. They're scared you'll break something. But in fact, if you don't do anything, you're at greater risk of breaking things. So being inactive is not an option, even for those with severe osteoporosis. So this is what uh, the scores are based on. It's really a bell-shaped curve. It's what the population gets. And so if you're on the left end of the spectrum, you're heading towards osteoporosis. If you're on the right end of the spectrum, you're good. You can move from the left side to the right side by changes in lifestyle. And even if the bone density doesn't increase, and that we'll talk about later, your bone strength can increase quite dramatically if you change your lifestyle. And this is really important. What is the main risk of osteoporosis? The main risk is death, unfortunately. And that results usually from fractures of the hip. Fractures of the hip caused by falls, and by this I don't mean fall from a height. Osteoporotic fractures result from uh, falling from a standing height, and that is enough to cause a fracture. So mortality is the main thing, so death. But unfortunately, you can get a lot of morbidity from fractures of the spine. So you've seen older people being quite stooped over. And that is because they've had fractures of their spine that have got them bent over. Unfortunately, 60% of fractures in the spine are asymptomatic. So they don't have pain at all. So osteoporosis, as I said, sometimes can present without pain. You just get bent over. And the best thing to do is get a DEXA scan and change your lifestyle. Start doing things that improve your bone stock. So really, when you get bent over, you can imagine you're compressing your stomach, your appetite decreases. Sometimes you can get a neurological deficit. And because your center of gravity falls ahead of you, you can get more falls because you're imbalanced. So you have issues with balance at that stage. If you look at the CDC database, and this is American data, I'm afraid, they, they keep their data quite well, so I thought I'll just refer to this. If you look at accidental deaths as a percentage of the population, you'll see that from the ages of 65, unfortunately, and I'm getting there soon, so I'm worried, because half the population die because of osteoporotic fractures. And if you look at ages 85 and over, the vast majority of accidental deaths are due to falls and fractures. And if you sift out and the population itself, you can see that the number of people increase the, uh, who are 85 and over who are dying from falls increases hugely. But it actually starts much earlier. So even ages 55, to 64 and so on, you can see that people are dying from osteoporosis. And the problem is not just an immediate death. The problem is that the high death rate persists for years after a hip fracture, whatever your age. So in reality, the one you really need to avoid is a hip fracture. You've seen that in your families, I'm sure. Uh, it is a horrible way to go, and I wouldn't like to leave after a hip fracture. 
I'd rather go swiftly with something else, being hit by a bus or something. Um, now, look at the whole food plant-based diet. And as I said to you, I have a bias towards this. It's changed my life. And I admit that it, it's not easy for everybody to transition to a whole food plant-based diet. But for those omnivores um, uh, here, I would just urge you to reduce the amount of meat and dairy consumption, which is really no good for your health. We'll talk about that slowly. But this is the diet that can actually prevent heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes. I reverse my type 2 diabetes, dementia, and many cancers. But the question is, does it work for bone health and prevention of fractures? And recent studies, there have been some papers that have come out saying that vegans are more prone to fractures. But in fact, if you look at the papers, they were epidemiological studies. They weren't very good quality. And if you look at some of the basic errors in them, it's because those vegans weren't doing the things that I will talk about in this, uh, in this talk. So if you look at what I've learned from those papers, it's that dairy and eggs don't seem to be particularly protective. So those of you who consume dairy and eggs do it because you enjoy something, maybe once in a way, but there are a lot of healthier options. The plant-based proteins are far better for your general health. They have much more fiber. They are better for your nutrition overall. Plant protein is much more important than vegans are willing to accept, and I accept that. You know, People seem to think if you eat any number of vegetables, you're fine, but I don't think you are. There should be a focus on plant-based proteins also. Okay, so just swapping 3% of animal protein in the diet for plant protein can reduce the risk of dying by 20 to 40%. This is why I'm urging all of you here that affluence, unfortunately, and that's happening in India, as we get more affluent, we tend to eat more meat. It's the same culture in China. It's the same culture that was there all along in the West. In fact, the West hasn't ever eaten decent plant proteins from beans or lentils which fortunately, as Indians, seems to be the staple diet still, uh, although it's rapidly changing for animal protein. Muscle gain, especially if you're over the age of 60, is particularly important, and you can gain muscle, and you can improve your bone strength even after that age. So if you want to gain your BMI, you know, which is a base, you're, you, you're aware of this index, it's a fallacious index, but nonetheless, the ideal uh, BMI should be around 23 if you're on a plant-based diet, but it should be mainly with an increase in muscle and bone mass. Okay, so soya is a much vilified plant protein, and I just want to uh, you know, say it's got a poor PR agency, I think. But soya is a, is a magic bean. And I would urge everybody in this audience, and inevitably this comes up in discussion because somebody would have read that it causes breast cancer or it gives you man boobs or something ridiculous of that kind. Soya is a product that really, I would urge you to eat two or two, three servings of every day. There are people who have eaten 25 servings, and yes, they've had problems, but they've eliminated some other things in their diet. But this really, you get enough branch chain amino acids which help with muscle growth, uh, and it stimulates bone strength also. So that's a shout out to soya, and there are a whole lot of soya products that give you just protein with very little calories. And, uh, it can be a useful supplement, especially for those of you who are older and lack a good appetite. And remember that if you lack appetite, the one macronutrient that you've got to consume is protein. So if you've got to eat it as a protein powder or something else or as a protein shake, then do have it. So your elderly parents at home who are struggling with their appetite, it's a useful therapeutic intervention to give them this form of protein. So I'm going to talk about prevention of osteoporosis under these three broad headings. So we'll talk about dietary factors, and I'm going to touch about the main macronutrient, which is protein. 
We'll talk about carbohydrates, which are vilified in the public. Everybody thinks carbohydrates are evil. Well, they're not. Refined carbohydrates are evil. So processed carbohydrates, no good. So chips, no good. White bread, no good. White rice, which is very popular, I know, because it's a sign of affluence again, I would say is less good than brown rice or red rice. We'll talk about some fats, essential fats in your diet, and micronutrients. So I can't go anywhere without talking about the Oscar-winning calcium, because everybody thinks calcium is what is important for osteoporosis. I'll definitely talk about that. We'll talk about exercise, and I'll just touch on sleep, smoking, alcohol, some of these other things. But also talk about prevention of falls, and in that, I really want to spend some time talking about strength and power and a little bit about balance, because balance is what deteriorates as we get older, and how to restore your balance we can talk about. Okay, so if you look at diet refractors, protein, the recommended daily allowance of protein for an adult is 0.83 grams per kilogram body weight. It's difficult to calculate, but if you just do it once or twice and look at your ev everyday consumption of foods, if you're reaching that target, you're safe. If you're below that target, you're really not in a good place. But older patients, so I would include anybody above the age of 65 should really aim for a higher protein consumption. And if you're doing strength training, which I would say everybody should do, and if your aim is to put on muscle and bone, you're really aiming at 1.6 gram per kilogram. And this I'll say just once, all plant, all plant foods have protein. Even if you eat a lettuce leaf, it has protein. Spinach has protein. Any food, rice has protein, it's just the quantity of protein isn't quite as much as some of the other foods may have. But there are whole plant sources, and they come packaged with phytonutrients, polyphenols, fiber, and they are much better for health. So I talked about soy bean already. So tofu and tempeh are excellent sources. And animal sources, they have protein undoubtedly, but they have no fiber, and they have they're very high in saturated fat, so you're at risk of cardiovascular disease if you consume animal proteins, including milk or dairy and cheese particularly. So the aim is to eat a diversity of uh, a variety of plant foods. So, soya, as I said, is a complete plant protein. You have all nine amino acids, and if you combine if you compare it to the so-called gold standard of egg white, it does just as well. And it has all these other substances. And interestingly, there's something called a CIRM effect, which is selective estrogen receptor modulation. It's quite a mouthful. Doctors like to make things complicated. But if I can simplify it, it has a positive effect on bone and muscle. So you can help grow bone and muscle and it has a very low effect on the breast. So if you have breast cancer, or if you've had a recurrence of breast cancer, or if you're under treatment for breast cancer, these are good foods. So soya is useful in any age group, whatever the background, and it's an excellent food. So another big shout out to soya. And if you look at the micronutrients, you know, the, the nutritional elements, in soya, it has very little carbohydrate, which is predominantly um, an indigestible material called stachyose. And that stachyose is poorly digested. So it really just creates some signals. It has quite a bit of fat, and these are omega-3 fats, which are really good for health. So soya, in general, gives you fewer calories, but gives you a high-protein diet. So this is... Um, this is another shout out to plants giving you your main source of proteins. And this is from a nurse's health study, a really big study. And they looked at it and saw that a higher plant protein consumption decreased frailty. Frailty is weakness. And we'll, we'll get into strength and how to measure it, etc., by 14%. Whereas higher animal proteins increased frailty by 7%. So you became weaker, in effect, if you took a higher amount of 
uh, animal protein. And there's certainly a positive impact of replacing dairy and non-dairy proteins uh, with plant proteins. This is uh, the nurse's health study. There's also another thing that if you're using it as a therapeutic effect, you know, so if you're using protein powders, even then you can be pretty unpleasant to be around if you're consuming whey protein. Uh, this is just a, a joke slide, but it gives you an idea that you can get plant proteins even uh, as a powder, which is quite useful. What about protein supplements? Uh, there's no evidence at all to suggest that they're harmful. Some people have come out with heavy metal presence. They say that there's some more in protein powders. But they're really useful, I think, in elderly patients if their appetite is affected. Other good sources are silk and tofu. You can use nut butters. You can use seitan, which is a wheat product and tastes also very much like meat for those who are transitioning, especially or those who want just a dense source of protein. That's really quite a useful source. But make sure there's a plant protein at every uh, meal. Just make sure there's some beans, some lentils, uh, some soybean product, maybe tofu or tempeh at each meal, ideally. Uh, and if you do that, you can do your strength training and be assured that you're stimulating your muscles to grow. There's something called mTOR. It's the mammalian target of rapamycin. Uh, and really, what we want is to have three main meals rather than snack in between, because snacking stimulates this mTOR uh, all over the body, not just in your muscle. In your muscle, it helps muscle grow, but if it's all over the body, it can cause cancer and so on. So in fact, snacking is not a great idea. And older people, as I said, with a poor appetite should really consider a protein powder supplement. So what does the future look like? I think there are exciting new sources of protein. You can get mycoproteins from fungi and they taste pretty good. There are some cheat meats I've seen around here also. In India, while well, I've been visiting, I've looked around in supermarkets and I've seen some really interesting uh, sources of mycoproteins. There is lab-grown meat. So while it is from meat that is originally from an animal, this will gradually, I think, take over because the cruelty to animals aspect of it goes away completely with lab-grown meat. But it does have saturated fat, so it's not going to entirely solve the health problem, but it's good for the planet and reduces animal suffering. You can get dairy equivalents, so they've got whey. So those people who are fond of whey as a protein source, you can get it now from precision fermentation. So earlier, if you remember, insulin used to be got by slaughtering pigs uh, until they developed precision fermentation, which is a way of making insulin. The same method has been used to get whey protein. And animal agriculture, which is, anybody who looks at it will agree it's horribly clear, um, cruel. I mean, we try to close our eyes about it, that it doesn't occur, because when it comes packaged neatly as a bit of meat or chicken, you don't recognize what has gone into producing that meat or chicken to look so sterile. It isn't. It's, uh, it's really bad for the planet, it's bad for the animals, it's bad for everything. Okay, so, um, sorry, this seems to get stuck sometimes. Dietary factors, I'm just going to talk a little bit about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are present in all our whole foods also. So if you have whole grains, so if you have red rice or brown rice, or if you have whole wheat chapatis, they're whole grains, they're present in fruit, they're present in vegetables. And these, besides beans, of course, beans are very important, legumes are whole foods. And these are excellent sources of carbohydrates. And fiber, by contributing to prebiotics and increasing a production of short-chain fatty acids in the bowel, cause these are called signaling molecules. It may have beneficial effects on bone. And there's been a good Chinese study that looked at vegetables and fruit. The more you eat vegetables and fruit, and it's heartening to see so much fruit on display while driving around Bangalore. Um, big shout out to prunes, especially for elderly people who get constipated. Prunes 
have phenolics and uh, that helps retain calcium within bones. So it's another good reason to consume prunes. And if you look at all these micronutrients, such as vitamin A, which is present in carotenoids uh, and lycopene and vitamin C, they're all present in fruit. But as a vegan or a plant-based diet, you must supplement your vitamin B12. There's no other real way of getting it. So you must take a tablet for it. I'd rather take a tablet of vitamin B12 than a statin or some other tablet uh, if, which is needed if your cholesterol levels go up. B12, by the way, must be supplemented by anybody above the age of 50, even if you're omnivorous. Omnivores generally don't suffer a deficiency, but anybody above the age of 50 must supplement B12 because you get a neurological disorder, uh, which is called subacute combined degeneration of the cord, and that is dangerous. You, it's irreversible, you can fall, you lose your balance, but you also your bones become brittle and you can get fractures. So the other important thing is vitamin D. Now, we're, we're very scared of sunshine, it seems, in India. Also, if you wear clothes, by the way, um, even if you're exposed to sunshine, you don't make vitamin B, uh, D in your skin. It is a sunshine vitamin. Vitamin D is produced when UVB light strikes the skin. And in India, while the sun is abundant, we're all conscious of wanting to look fairer for some mysterious reason, and we don't expose our skin. Of course, if you expose your face to sunlight, you age rapidly, but exposing the rest of your body actually gives you vitamin D. But I would say it's safer just to supplement vitamin D in your diet. If you're not getting enough, and it's a simple blood test that measures it, it is really vitally important for absorption of calcium in the gut and calcium homeostasis. It's also important for muscle strength, especially activity of what we call fast twitch fibers, and that helps to prevent falls. So this is another big important role of vitamin D. And really the level we want to be at is somewhere, the sweet spot is I would say between 50 and 75 or around that. It's quite hard to become toxic with vitamin D. There are people who've consumed too much of vitamin D and they can get toxicity. But if you get your levels measured and it's a simple and fairly cheap blood test, that should protect your bones fairly well. Coming to the Oscar winning micronutrient, calcium, it's the balance that is important. So you might consume all the calcium that you want, but if you are also losing it, in your diet or in your gut or in your urine, it doesn't really help. So broadly speaking, vitamin D helps calcium towards bone and vitamin K, which you get from green leafy vegetables, helps to retain it in bone. So this is just a broad outline. Whenever people think of calcium, they think of dairy and it's hardly a wonder because they've spent so much on advertising it and everybody thinks it's a complete food, but they don't look at the problems associated with dairy. And if you look at the nurses health study, there's really no advantage of dairy and dairy consumption in countries such as Netherlands, which is very high, is also associated with the high risk of fractures. And the required daily allowance of calcium varies. In fact, India doesn't even have an RDA for it, but yet very, we're very, very fond of our dairy in this country. And the reason I think we don't have a set RDA in India is that in the past we were a low meat eating diet and meat is acidic in general. So the reason the USA has such a ridiculously high level for their required daily allowances because they consume so much of this acidic food, meat uh, in general, that they, they lose a lot of their calcium and they have to have a high turnover of calcium. So we can get enough. In the UK, they, they seem to have found a sweet spot of 700 milligrams and that you can get easily on a plant-based diet. These are all the sources, in fact, um, by eliminating the middleman, which is the cow, you can get it straight from your green leafy vegetables. 
just need to avoid spinach as a primary source of calcium because it has a lot of oxalates, so you don't get good absorption of calcium from spinach. But as long as you have a variety of greens, so collards, okra, bok choy, broccoli, kale, all these are great sources uh, of calcium, as are sesame seeds, so tahini is a great source again, and hummus. Besides, of course, the, the plant-based milks and uh, tempeh and tofu, which are great sources of calcium. We should focus a little bit on calcium thieves, which means we are losing calcium as a result of consuming these things. And cola drinks are particularly guilty of that. So they have phosphoric acid, salt, and sugar. So it's like a triple whammy. You lose much more calcium in your urine as a consequence. Three to four cups of coffee, for those of you fond of coffee, seems to be protective in premenopausal women. Nobody studied it in postmenopausal women, so I would probably lower the limit there. Um, but these are all the reasons why we lose a lot of our calcium. Just one thing to urge for everybody here who's on a calcium supplement as a tablet, it's not good. There have been lots of meta-analysis, and in fact, people have suggested that if you consume calcium as a tablet, then it could go straight through your atheroma and cause damage to the heart. So I would urge people to avoid taking it except in whole foods. And the specific foods that vegans should focus on is a calcium set tofu. You can get plenty of calcium through that or uh, in, uh, in your tempeh. And one gram of soy protein is associated with these isoflavones that I talked about, which are protective to bone. And they're low activity in the breast. Our main thing is to talk a little bit about exercise and our lifestyle. We've become quite a sedentary society in general. And I would say that we don't stop exercising when we get old. We get old because we stop exercising. I think it's a great saying to focus on. So our whole old habits have to really change to new habits. And when we look at bone strength, it's a combination of exercises that really helps to improve your bone density. People talk about walking as a great exercise. I tell all my patients who do walking, it's a great thing to do, but it's meditation. It's not really going to improve your bone strength unless, and we'll show you during our discussion, you add some weights to your walk, and we can talk about that. Now, you should try and build in false prevention, such as Tai Chi and whole body vibration. These are things that help you with your balance. But the key is to develop your lower limbs. So your lower leg muscles are really important because it helps even to generate certain uh, signaling molecules that helps with cognition. So dementia prevention, strength of the lower limbs. I mean, the upper limbs are for vanity for younger people uh, to show off on a beach, but really not useful from the point of prevention of hip fractures. And even in elderly patients, there have been studies from Australia where people over the age of 70 have done weight training and have found improved bone density. Now, this is just to give you an idea about the types of exercises. And what surprised me was that running didn't actually make that much of a difference. So running, even though it looks like an impact and gravity bone exercise, and that's perhaps because runners are generally thinner in, uh, you know, they're slimmer, they're more effective running. Now, some of these are ridiculous sports that I wouldn't want anybody to do, like college football and mixed martial arts and so on. But suffice it to say that in general, resistance training comes up pretty high, even in women and in men, it really does improve your bone strength a lot. And these are the type of things. So if you play golf and you carry your own bags, sadly in India, most people seem to have a caddy, but, or if you do rucking, where you carry a weight on your back, or if you just jump, I mean, jump 10 times before you go in for a shower, it'll generate a good sweat. Skipping is great. Basketball actually generates a lot of bone because it's all in different axis that you do it. So it's, it's like a three-dimensional increase in bone. 
So bone adapts, bone is living tissue, and if you load bone, it actually becomes stronger. It's the same effectively as muscles. So big shout out to resistance training. It really, you can start at any point. Even young children can start doing some resistance training, but the aim is to work out at least twice a week and work out ideally all groups of muscles. The benefit is it reduces sarcopenia, it reduces osteoporosis. Sarcopenia is muscle loss. Now this is an important slide and if you take away one thing, this will give you an idea of the importance of exercise. So if you look at smoking, it increases all cause mortality by 50%, huge. Diabetes, 30%. High blood pressure, 20% increase in mortality. So these are bad news disorders. But being weak relative to being strong is 250%. So can you see the difference? And there are metrics for this. So being weak, a simple test if you go back home is to sit down in a chair, stand up without assistance at least five times in 15 seconds. And if you can't do that without falling over, so be careful, have somebody around you, that is a sign of frailty and is bad news. So being weak relative to being strong, 250% change. If you talk about strengthening, the main principle is something called progressive overload. So if you're doing resistance training, it's important to try and do more and more and go to fatigue at each stage. And that really induces adaptation in your muscles and your bones and makes those changes. So Lifting a constant weight every day and doing the same number of repetitions of exercise will not help generate bone strength or muscle strength. And that is what induces the adaptation that I talked about. The important thing is when you stimulate your muscles, and you've all heard of cytokines from the COVID times where there were these signaling molecules that went all over the body. Similarly, there are myokines that go to the brain so the bigger the muscles that you're exercising, so low limb muscles are really important, the myokines go and stimulate memory, they prevent cognitive decline, they also improve, your, they improve loss of fat, they cause a variety of changes that helps with diabetes and a variety of these disorders. So just to, this is just a, a pictogram that gives you a very good idea of what myokines do. I think one of the reasons why women don't take easily to strength training is they feel they look too muscular. Uh, I can assure women who are here or otherwise that men have been trying hard to look more muscular and it's not easy. So you really have to make a lot of effort. Now, this is what happens before strength training. You are recruiting a certain number of motor fibers. So if I want to pick up this glass, I know how many muscle fibers I have to recruit. But if to, I have to pick up a 10 kilogram weight, I'm going to recruit more muscle fibers. And if I keep doing that, it's not as if my muscles are getting any bigger, I'm just recruiting more fibers. And this is the key to understanding strength. And strength is really more important than just hypertrophy of muscles. So this is um, to give you an idea. Now, Sarcopenia is an important topic. So we lose muscle as we age, just as we lose bone. And the important thing is type two muscle fibers tra transition to a type one muscle fiber. And I'll just go into that in a simple uh, illustration later. But that is what determines power. That's why as we get older, we get slower at doing things because we're losing power the speed of doing work. And there's a constant loss of muscle fibers as we go along. So this is what happens. So if you look at the gastronemius, that is principally a type two muscle fiber. They get fatigued faster. But there's a high potential for rapid force development. And this is really what is important. Sarcopenia occurs with just simple bed rest, and that can result in problems. Huge uh, decompensation occurs when you're hospitalized. And if you look at this paper, it gives you an idea that you lose 
after the age of 40, you lose power three to 4% every year. So you lose your fast twitch muscle fibers, which is really important. Well, why is it important? Because imagine this lady who's walking along, she trips on a carpet, her balance is poor, but the main reason she's falling is that the fast twitch muscle fibers don't contract and put her leg in the right place so that she can stop herself from falling. And this is particularly important as we age. So resistance and weight-bearing exercises, there are a variety of ways of doing it, but anything that moves weight or lifts it is really what we're looking at. So even body weight exercises, such as illustrated here, so standing up, you know, sit-ups, etc., cetera, um, are really quite important. So doing a stand, you know, uh, doing a toe stand, there are a variety of these exercises you can look up and start simply with body weight exercises. This is really what helps activate your osteoblast. Sorry, I was rushing through. I was told I had a little time, but it appears we have more time uh, than that. But just to give you an idea, this is where lifestyle medicine comes in. At every phase of osteoporosis, lifestyle advice is important. So even if your severe osteoporosis, that is your T-score is below minus 2.5, Lifestyle advice is paramount. So instead of wrapping people in bubble wrap and saying, oh my God, you're osteoporotic, be careful, don't go out, don't step over this, don't do this, you'll fall, you'll break your things. I would say that even they can change dramatically their bone strength and muscle strength. And really with simple body weight exercises to start with, then go on to lifting weights. For those of you who are intimidated in going to a gym, and I fully understand that, I didn't go to a gym till I was 55 because I was intimidated. People there in the gym are actually there to do the same thing that you've gone there for. So if you look puzzled about using a certain machine or lifting a particular weight, you just have to turn to somebody who looks experienced and they'll help you. They're not going to laugh at you. They are going to be kind to you just as they would for somebody else on a journey. But you don't have to go to a gym. You can do a lot of these exercises. We've got some things for display later to demonstrate a few things that you can get stronger just sitting at home. During COVID times, I did a lot of training at home using just those resistance bands, which are a really effective workout. In fact, better in some ways than using free weights like dumbbells. And there are these drugs, which a lot of people are put on. What they do is they give you an artificial elevation of your bone density because they stop your osteoclast from acting. So often your dentist will, will, well, the physician will tell you, go get a dental check first. Because if you have gum disease, and most people have gum disease as they get older, the teeth become loose and you're also more prone to getting fractures because your bones become brittle and you get what are called atypical fractures. So these drugs are not harmless. You've heard of their trade names like Bon Viva and so on. In fact, using a lot of these trade names means sometimes people don't know what they're on. But if somebody related to you is on a tablet once a week, they're possibly on this bisphosphonate. Now, this is what I urge people to do. Try and move, fill your plate with healthy looking whole grains, vegetables, fruit, legumes, so beans, dals, you know, lentils, soups, herbs and spices to your heart's content, nuts and seeds, a small handful. Avoid processed foods such as oils, which have a lot of nutrition removed. And if you don't know what a whole food plant-based way of eating is, try some of your local plant-based restaurants. I mean, if you go to Just Be, for instance, you'd get a typical whole food plant-based meal that is delicious. Um, but you can try and eliminate or slowly reduce the amount of meat or any animal product that you eat by eating a large amount of these foods, which are much healthier for you. 
this is what is processed food. So processed meats in particular, so burgers, bacon, salami, those are meats that are particularly harmful to health. They're known to cause cancer, in fact. They have a strong correlation with cancer. And this is what I would call food-like food substances. I mean, they have a lot of nutrition removed. So if you look at a chip, for instance, I mean, if you eat a white potato that is boiled with its skin, it's a perfectly nutritious food. It's also known to be the most satiating food. So it fills you up and it's very low calorically. Plus it has all uh, the micronutrients. If you eat a boiled potato or a steamed potato or a jacket potato, but if you fry the hell out of it after removing the skin, and you have chips or you have crisps, uh, they call chips in India, I think, and they really don't carry much nutrition. They don't fill you up, and as a consequence, you consume extra calories. There are studies to show that you consume a total of 500 calories extra if you eat junk food, as we label it. And if I go to any grocery store nowadays, I see most of the shelves are full of junk food. So people who don't understand what ultra-processed food is, we can go into a discussion about it, but basically if you remove the nutrition, the nutritive elements from food, that is what ultra-processed food is about. And this doesn't really nourish your bones. So to summarize, minimize your ultra-processed foods. I would suggest minimize salt, sugar, and oil. Get your protein from plant sources, far healthier. Embrace the benefits of soy in your food, and I would urge two to three portions a day will help with your bones. Enjoy lentils and other beans. These are fiber-rich foods and excellent for health. Alcohol, I mean, enjoy your glass of wine if you do, but remember, there's no safe limit for alcohol, and that applies to your bones too. Smoking, well, nothing good can be said about that particular habit. Coffee in excess, so as I said, three to four cups it seems to be protective. It does have phytonutrients in it. It has some excellent uh, uh, antioxidants in coffee. Um, avoid the excess of sugar and avoid these massive Starbucks macchiato or caramel something or the other, which is more like a dessert because that has close to 700, 800 calories in it. Avoid unnecessary supplements. So I've talked about the few supplements that I would tell you to use. So vitamin B12, vitamin D, but really avoid unnecessary supplements. They're no good. So taking an excess of B complex, everybody in this country seems to be on B complex capsules. Unnecessary. If you're eating good food, you get it all through that. So your protein is the main macronutrient, and I would suggest use a plant-based source. Whole food is best, but you can use plant proteins as a therapeutic intervention in smoothies. You can use your vitamin D and B12 supplements. There's another supplement that I would urge most people to use, and that is creatine. Now, creatine is particularly important, I would say, for vegans. It's a combination of certain amino acids that allow you to lift better weights. Plus it improves your cognition. It's also been studied as being one, it's been the most studied supplement. So for those of you who are interested in doing resistance training, um, creatine also makes you look stronger. It actually makes your muscles grow a little because it absorbs some water into that. But it also helps you lift greater weights. So it does help you get stronger quicker. So where do I start? You know, everybody has this worry. Oh my God, you've told me all this stuff. I don't know where to go. So I would say dietary changes one meal at a time. Just take a breakfast and cut out the cereal that you're getting from a processed Kellogg's packet that you think is healthy. It really isn't. Convert to a whole food plant-based breakfast. Nothing better than porridge, you know, uh, steel-cut porridge, oats with... Um, some soy milk and some fruit and nuts, ideal way to start the day. Then convert to lunch, then convert to dinner. Think of a plant-based replacement for every meal and think what protein source am I getting today in my meal? I think as we strength train, that is important. 
and exercise a little more every day. If you're walking and you enjoy your walking, just walk a little bit more briskly. Walk a little more every day. You can do exercise snacks. For those of you who have desk-based jobs and a lot of IT is based in Bangalore, so I imagine a lot of you are in that. Just stand up 10 times at your desk. It might look silly to others, but it helps you strengthen your legs. And it helps you get up every now and then and do a little exercise snack. And I would say build in resistance training. Start with simple body weight exercises, some simple press ups, sit ups, even doing an air, air sitting thing. I was telling somebody outside to sit as if you're in a chair, but you're not on a chair. You're just sitting for a minute or so. It really taxes your muscles. And I can tell you that's a good way of starting. But remember the principle of progressive overload. So try and do a little more. If you're using weights of five kilograms to do 10 repetitions in three sets this week, try and go up to six kilograms next week for the same exercise. You might be able to do less repetitions or less sets, but you've gone heavier and that helps you get stronger. And balance is a simple thing. Everybody nowadays uses an electric brush. It kind of gives you a buzz buzz sound after 30 seconds. So stand on one leg and just brush your teeth standing on one leg. Close your eyes and stand on one leg for a little bit. It's a good way of developing your habits of balance. And then you can do other things like don't sit down when you're putting your shoes and socks on. I mean, I'm telling you all this, don't go immediately and do crazy things at home. You don't want to fall over and break your hip right now, but you can practice this with care. Just stand up and get your shoes and socks on. It helps with your balance. Finally, some resources, and uh, I think we'll start having a discussion. Th these are just some useful resources that uh, I found very good in my journey, and you can take a, you can just look at all these things. Um, and see which you like. Thank you very much. Another source that this said we also like exercise. So this would be something like for your shoulders, you know, to get some external rotation. So this is important because as we age, our shoulders. I'm quite loud, so I'm sure I can for this. Yeah, for the record. Yeah. Okay, so the shoulder muscles, for instance, we damage them as we get older. You've heard of frozen shoulders or rotator cuff injuries. So it's really quite important to train the small muscles around the shoulder. And an exercise band this kind will help you just strengthen it. This is a light one. There are heavier ones that you can use. I mean, this, for instance, has heavy written on it. So this would be something that you want to do exercises for the small muscles of your shoulder. But you could snip it around your legs, for instance, and just use it to strengthen your abductors, which are the principal muscles around the hip area that help you. I don't want to fall over and make a fool of myself here, so let me do this Okay. So if you put this around your knees, for instance, all you do is shuffle sideways till you can't go any further. You can feel the main muscle around your hip contract. And then bring this over a little bit, not all the way, and then go further again. So this is a simple abductor muscle exercise with a heavier band. You can get heavier bands, in fact, heavier than this too, that really make a good exercise for this. The other thing about resistant bands um, that you really should understand is that unlike a dumbbell where all you're doing is lifting a weight which remains constant throughout, a resistance band actually the resistance increases. So if I hold this for instance by this, I'm doing a bicep curl. If I hold that and I push it, pull it upwards, the resistance increases as I go upwards. So in fact, it's a good adjunct to doing exercises with other free weights 
for if I was to use this weight, the weight is constant wherever the range of movement is. It doesn't increase, whereas this increases the OP. Okay. Couple of small things. For those who are really keen on walking, and walking is good, I'm not rubbishing it, really I'm not. In general, you should get about 150 minutes of aerobic or cardiovascular exercise per week. That's the American College of Lifestyle Medicine recommended that. So if you're walking 150 minutes briskly, that's a good amount of aerobic exercise. And at least two sessions of strength training, a minimum of 30 minutes each per week, is what the college recommends as keeping good health. If you exercise more than that, you will get incremental benefits. And unless you do crazy amounts of exercise above that, you will continue to get benefit for every bit of exercise that you do. Now this is a great, this is an ankle strap, or do you use it as a wrist? Okay, so you can wrap this around your ankle. It's a simple way that if you can get it in, you know, it's a velcro of things, you can add it, so it really makes your legs feel heavier when you walk. And it will help with your leg muscles. The legs are the important ones, because that's where you can get a fracture of the hip. So you want to strengthen your leg muscles, these are the bigger muscles. And if you use these ankle, weighted ankle things, don't see how much of a weight this is. So it's, I can see it's, it's about a kilogram. But it's a really good adjunct to it. And this is one and a half feet. And a similar weight you can get for your wrist also. So if you want to march around with an extra weight, you can do that. And this helps. By the way, you can get weighted jackets. Weighted jackets are like the leg jackets. They are a bad news for bando kind of heat at this time of the year. But in colder weather, it uh, will help with your spine. You know, I showed you a picture of rucking, which is popular in America, where you put a rucksack, you load it with bricks. Now we've got bricks in this one. But you can put it on the back. It helps you with your posture and it loads your spine. So instead of making other people carry your weights, you know, it's better to do it yourself. So if you have you know, a simple way of getting extra exercise is to park your car a bit further away. I notice there's a tendency to drive right up to the entrance of wherever you're going. In fact, people want to drive into the entrance, <laughs> into their table where they're sitting for dinner. I think it's worth being dropped off a few hundred yards away, just walking. That's the way you build in exercise in real life. I think that's about what I want to say. I mean, I've used certain terms, so if you're not clear, then those of you are unfamiliar with things like reps and sets, you know, repetitions and sets of exercise, those are typical resistance training, those who are doing dumbbells or free weights, to do repetitions. Uh, and sets are, so if you lift the weight, let's say I'm lifting this weight, and you know it's getting tiring for me at, after 10 repetitions. I should really go to the point of fatigue where my form changes. So in other words, I'm doing this because I can't really lift it anymore. And that's the point which you should stop at. So that one set of 10 repetitions. You take a two minute rest, allow your muscle to recover, and then go again 10 more times. And you should be able to do it. So that's sets and reps, just to give you an idea of the body weight. Similar thing with body weight exercises, doing sit-ups and things. Uh, these are good ways to, and, and the beauty about resistance training is it's a metric that you can measure. You know, it's a bit like running a marathon in God knows how many hours. You know that you have, want to beat that next time. When you're lifting weights, you want to beat a certain weight that you manage to lift by lifting heavier and more number of reps. So it's a measure of thing. It makes you feel good. Because when you go back the next day and you uh, or next week and you can lift heavier, you're getting stronger. And as I said, rest assured, ladies in the audience, you will not look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or the men of the time for ages. So it's 
Yes, I'm Ladina Hata. I run Just Be. I'm founder of Just Be and a wellness coach. And uh, Dr. Bajekal has done some wonderful talks uh, in Bangalore every time he visits. It's amazing that he doesn't want to waste. He's come for personal work, but he's like, you know, I'll take out time and I'll come and share about this. And it's so important. Uh, I remember reaching out to him and his wife, who is Neetu Bajekal and one of the fantastic book on PCOS. She has just written and I had, I had just two years, a year back hit my menopause and going through exactly what you explained. And I felt that I am on whole food plant base and why am I going through this? Why is my body changing? And then I got an explanation about the estrogen level going low and how I suffered and what really helped me was strength training resistance exercises and all of this. And I just feel uh, as though my body is, uh, my whole body is actually uh, regenerating and it's something new what I experience uh, every single day. I can, it's been six months now since I'm exercising and I really feel that, uh, I'm so glad that we are having this talk and uh, it's been recorded so we can really spread the word because we definitely need to start exercising. And I want to ask that why is it you feel that in India, and I don't know other places, but here we exercise is not something which is a compulsion. It is not really spoken about. Or even if somebody gets into, uh, who wants to, uh, not paying too much attention into education, but wants to play, it's not really motivated to, you know, you're not really motivated to do that. What is... I think part of this is the urbanization. I mean, the spaces available are also being uh, reduced hugely. So when you go around, I mean, uh, you talk about India in that way. And I went to China recently and went before that to Vietnam. If you get up at six o'clock and walk around on the roads in the morning, everybody's into some form of sport or activity. They are organized, they're in parks, they're playing badminton, they're lifting weights, they're doing Tai Chi very beautifully and gracefully. Tai Chi, by the way, is great for balance. But somehow that culture hasn't really caught on. I mean, there are people, I see them walking briskly in parks here. But other than that, there's not so much of a culture of sport activity. I just don't know why that is the case. I would love to see it much more. And um, I think it is improving. There's certainly more people visible in the mornings walking briskly and doing some exercises and sit-ups and things like that. But it's not a culture that is widespread. So it's not all ages, uh, which you really want to see. If you go to China, you'll see people over the age of 80 in parks doing Tai Chi or lifting weights and you know, keep keeping themselves fit. You've got a point there. I think as a nation, we do need to change that culture. And I think, uh, like, I see my uh, parents or my in-laws, and I see that they are, uh, you know, resisting to exercise. And they feel that they're going to injure themselves. And, uh, and everybody's scared of fracture, as you said, definitely is. But very, very resisting to not to exercise. We see that very, very uh, common here. Walking is okay. A few just bending exercise inside exercises. That's like what we see in the, in the parks. That's what happens. Yes, very true. Uh, I mean, I think in general, it's just not taken up as much as... Yeah, and, and I think when we look at even Olympics, right? We don't see... We are getting a few medals, but... I think from India, there is something which is not... Uh, cricket is the best yeah, form. Yeah, cricket is the best form here. So actually, you have uh, covered all the questions which I had written, but I would like the audience, if you have some question, to... Uh, can muscle actually be added to it? I mean, the say. That's a very good question. Thank you. Okay, so uh, 
the first thing is you can add muscle at any age, but it is more difficult and you have to put in more effort. So you saw the curve of when osteoporosis, the timeline, and in fact, the 30 to 40 year age is the maximum bone density that we all have. And after that, your bone density and your muscle strength decreases every year. Every decade, it goes down by three to 8%. But if you make changes and if you do resistance training, there was a beautiful study from Australia where they had elderly women, you know, women aged 70 plus. I'm talking about women, not just men. Uh, women aged 70 who started serious lifting, and I'm talking about deadlifts, you know, that's quite a difficult exercise for those of you who have deadlifted. It's an exercise that you can do really badly and get injured, or you can do really well and get stronger very quickly because it is what is called a compound exercise. So in other words, that exercise works very many muscles. So it works a whole lot of muscles and a whole lot of joints across many joints. So it is particularly good for building muscle, but also good for your back, surprisingly. One would think that deadlifts are bad. So these are people over the age of 70, women who have improved their bone density and muscle strength dramatically. There was one woman age 70, um, who I think weighed about 50 kilograms, and she was deadlifting her own weight comfortably. And they've shown those results. The second question was milk being, um, why, why are we against it, if you like, I think. Well, first of all, milk comes in a variety of ways. Uh, I don't, there, there's a lot of debate about milk being healthy, but the fact that it is utilized in so many products that you then will consume quite readily, it has a lot of saturated fat in it. So the saturated, it's got no fiber. It's, it's actually meant for a baby calf to really become a baby cow, a grown up cow in a few months. So it's got a lot of insulin like growth factors which enable this small baby cow to transition to a big cow. So I think there are certain deleterious effects. I mean, it's been proven that it has a strong relationship to prostate cancer. So for men, certainly, milk in its, I mean, you can have a small amount of milk in your coffee, but I would suggest to you that if you're having it as a large component of your diet, try switching. First of all, 70% of Indians are lactose intolerant which means you get stomach upsets, you get gas, you get pretty unpleasant to be around if you're lactose intolerant. And in the south of India, lactose intolerance is higher than in the north. So I think here, certainly you should look at the reason why your stomach gets upset the day you have more dairy products. And I think replacing it with a simple switch to soya products um, and I would recommend the unsweetened soya milks, which don't have the added sugar uh, or the non-barista quality, which have the added oils, if you like. But they're far healthier for you than dairy. So I wouldn't rubbish dairy as a source, uh, as a primary source of uh, nutrients. But I think there are a lot better things that can be put in your diet instead of cow's milk. Plus, from a personal and ethical viewpoint, as I said to you, I'm a declared vegan. Uh, and I think that the dairy industry does contribute a whole lot to this planet being a bad place. And what we don't see, of course, for those of you who are vegetarian and feel that is an ethical choice, is that ultimately the, the milk giving cow lasts only for so many years. And although they think that they somehow disappear, they don't. They're slaughtered and they're used as meat. So the dairy industry contributes to the meat industry, which by far is the biggest pollutant and the biggest cause for climate change, I would say. So that's my personal uh, bias against dairy. But I would like to add what you added, you just showed in the slide. And we all need 
dairy, we have dairy and we force our children like we I did when I my children were younger is to have a lot of milk because where would the, we get the calcium from? And what you just showed in the chart was why don't we get it directly from the grass and from the greens what the, the cows are eating. Exactly. So we would get that. Cut all down of the this. middle animal. Cut down the middle animal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, you were talking about supplementation. So you kind of just shot down calcium, which we are taking regularly as women. Uh, but you said that we should take vitamin D, uh, vitamin K and B12. Uh, do you have any particular amount which you suggest for vitamin D? Because that's also debatable as a, a daily or a weekly thing. And also, what do you think about HRT because of estrogen depletion and... Uh, what is your take on that? Sure. And uh, in case we need to take vitamin D from the sun, when uh, when would you suggest is the right time to get out in the sun and for how long? Okay, all excellent questions, but there were three. So <laughs> I'll answer all of them. Okay, so the, the first question was vitamin D, I think you asked, how much would I recommend supplementation? Um, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I think Indians absorb vitamin D poorly from your diet. I personally, uh, I thought I was doing well. I was taking what the recommended daily allowances in the UK, 400 units, and I got my levels checked and I was shocked. I was the level of an institutionalized adult, elderly person in the UK. So I. 400 units, and I talked to my daughter who's a nutritionist, I should have talked to her before I embarked on this. I would suggest to you 4,000 units a day is the appropriate amount. Get your levels measured in case you're freakishly good at absorbing vitamin D, then your levels will climb. But remember there's such a safe level for vitamin D because the, the supplements that you're taking have to be converted to the active form, and the body is really good at regulating that. So I think 4,000 is a safe of international units I'm talking about, not milligrams. 4,000 international units a day is what I would say is a reasonably safe level. I shot down calcium because um, I think you should get it from your diet, just in whole foods. When you consume a calcium tablet by itself, it actually causes an immediate rise in your elemental calcium levels. Now, I don't know what levels you measure calcium in India, I've forgotten the system, but in the UK, the range for serum calcium that is in your blood is very narrow because it's very well regulated. If you go hypocalcemic, you get tetany, you get into funny contractions of muscles. Hypercalcemia is frankly dangerous, so the body regulates it to a very narrow window, but if you take calcium tablets, it causes such spikes that the body has to act and deposit it somewhere else. And these studies were pretty scary. I've looked at the Heidelberg EPIC trial, it's called. It's also a big paper from New Zealand, from Auckland, that first looked at a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis, for those of you who are into research, is a study of a wide, large number of papers. And they all, suggest, uh, they all said that there was a higher rate of myocardial infarction, of heart attacks, if you consumed calcium in its elemental form. So calcium doesn't make good bones. Just eat the food. And India doesn't even have an, uh, you know, a recommended dietary allowance. So if you keep it quite low even then, you're safe with calcium. The last question was about HRT. I wish my wife was here. I would have bounced this question straight to her. HRT is good, bottom line. And I would, uh, if I was a woman, I'd take it. Um, I think it's safe in general. You would need to get a doctor's uh, recommendation on it. And obviously, if you have a family history of breast cancer or something of that kind, you would really need to consult with your doctor, but it's great for your bones. It helps to prevent the side effects of menopause, which can be quite debilitating. I get 
I get people about five times a year, women who are around the menopause, who come to me with bizarre symptoms, you know, and you, you, your first inclination is to think, God, what, what's she talking about? This doesn't make any sense. So she'll say, my shoulder aches, my knee hurts, my ankle hurts, my this hurts. And you look at them and they're quite normal. And then you say, you know, are you going through your menopause? And they are. So it's quite distressing, these symptoms. And I don't mean to downplay it ever, but they're great. HRT is great for that. Soya is also great for that, by the way. So if you have soya products, um, your menopausal symptoms can improve quite a so, lot. So do you yeah. take the vitamin K with the D? You should take the K okay. with the D. Okay, that's a good question again. And I, I eliminated the slides to run through it a bit quicker. Vitamin K supplements are not yet um, recognized as being good. There's only one study from Japan where in postmenopausal women, it seems to have a dose, uh, you know, 45 milligrams of vitamin K seems to have beneficial effects. I wouldn't jump into vitamin K supplements yet. I think you get enough in green leafy vegetables which are converted to the active forms in the colon. And the last one was how much sun and when? Ah, that's a great question. So uh, I know Hemendra is dying to answer this, but I'll get there before him. But in general, in the, if you live in the West, you want to, there's something called Holloway's rule. So if you stand in the sun and your shadow is longer than you are, your height, you know, so if you're six feet tall and your shadow is seven feet long, that sun is not going to make vitamin D for you. So your shadow has to be shorter. So in other words, the optimum time is between 10 a.m. and 4, or 2 p.m., I would say. On naked skin, I would suggest exposing the back of your back, your back, your legs, and your arms. It ages your face, so always wear a hat or sun protection and get into the sun. Indians make vitamin D badly because of the color of our skin. So uh, I'm, by the way, I got burned because I was watching the ridiculous test match, India versus Australia, the, the last test. Uh, and it was one of those rare occasions in the UK where you get sunlight. So I got tanned very rapidly, but we make vitamin D poorly from sunlight uh, and we have to stay there longer. So I would say half an hour to 45 minutes before you slap on sunscreen or get out of the sun. I, I think you, yeah, um, um, yoga has so many forms. There are some pretty, you know, energetic forms of yoga, which are good for muscle and bone strength. But in general, the way I see yoga, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's not so much of an anti-gravity exercise. It does help your mobility hugely. So I would use yoga as an adjunct to strength training where it gives you greater mobility. I, for instance, it's taken me ages to do a deep squat like you would do in an Indian style toilet. And considering I grew up using them in my school, um, I was ashamed that having gone to the West and sitting on chairs like this all the time, I was finding it difficult to do a squat. Um, and yoga would have helped me hugely in that. So it helps in that way. My question is almost related to him. And when we talk about the problem that we have, which is osteoporosis and is more pronounced in older ages. Uh, something like strength training is counterproductive when people are not able to carry their own weight. How do we suggest extra weight, uh, you know, to counter that, right? And, yeah. And uh, coming to uh, what, uh, um, what he said about flexibility, uh, specifically from a bone point of view, especially the joints, right? I would feel that flexibility of the joints or the range of movements of the joints would be more, um, I would say, beneficial in terms of keeping them to their range of motion rather than building strength on the muscles. What's your take on that? Um, and, and especially uh, using a mat and doing uh, exercises lying down, especially for older people because they are losing balance. And also from a lower back point of view, which is more related to your lower limbs, 
I think um, doing uh, uh, flexibility exercises, lying down will be much more beneficial. It also involves resistance when you try to do it in different sets of numbers. I, I would agree with that almost entirely what you've said, you know, but there's certain huge quality of life changes which you will notice as you get older. If you're sitting on a lower chair, like for me, this is a reasonably low chair because my knees are flexed to more than 90 degrees. But if I can stand up from this without support, that's a huge quality of life improvement, you know. And I think if you're, the lower you can go down in your squat, the stronger your leg muscles will become. So it's related to that also. So from that angle, I think it's important to get as much of a range of movement as possible also. Yeah. Uh, I've been hypothyroid for almost 28 years now, and you mentioned soya quite often. I know that soya is contraindicated. No. Um, that's another one of the myths. What it is contraindicated with is when you're consuming thyroxine replacement, you should leave a gap of one to two hours before, well, probably two hours is safer before you consume soya because it seems to retard the absorption of your thyroid hormones. So it's got no contraindications at all with uh, thyroid treatment, but you just leave a gap for the consumption. So for instance, if you're having your tablet in the morning, don't have your soy milk or soy yogurt in your breakfast. Have it a bit later. And it's absolutely fine and safe. Thank you. Do you really feel that whole food plant base really helps in thyroid? We've seen it reversing when you're onto such diet. Okay. Are we done for time? Yes. So we'll just close the session just to let Thank you know. Thank you so much.